Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Today, we have one more set of great revenge stories. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. And our first story. Selectively enforce the rules? Okay, let's follow them to the letter now. I used to work for a manufacturing company who makes waste containers, dumpsters, and such. And at first, it was a good job. With a good manager and no problems, I enjoyed the work. It was a dirty, physically demanding job, but kept me in good shape. I could just put in my earbuds and cruise through the day without any issues. My initial job was to prep the units for painting by polishing imperfections with the sander and grinding down the areas that were too rough, as well as cleaning them up after the welders were done with them. But after a while, they kept laying off so many people and dumping their jobs on me that eventually, towards the end of my time there, I was quality control, helped the painter, was a warehouseman, finisher, grinder, and also janitor for no additional pay beyond the small cost of living raises we got once in a while. After about a year of working for this company, prior to having all these jobs dumped on me without any issues, new management showed up, and as they like to do, they started making all kinds of changes just for the sake of making changes. Things that made jobs harder with no benefit, cutting corners that should not be cut, and generally hurting productivity and workplace safety. The change in management was bad, but it was not the end of the world. It made things harder for no real reason, but all in all, things were still manageable. Until I ended up off work for about a month with a collapsed lung that I still to this day believe was caused by the working conditions there and the lack of ventilation and PPE. When I came back to work, I was on light duty for quite some time since I'd had surgery to repair the lung and prevent it from collapsing again. I went from the golden boy who they called on when crap had to get done to the redheaded stepchild of the company, and management was doing everything they could to get me to quit. They would throw away my tools, hide my stools so I couldn't use them while I was working, hassle me over things like my earbuds, citing safety as why I couldn't use them, even though OSHA themselves told me it was not an issue. The production manager would lie about things and write me up for non-existent violations, refuse to fix my bay doors that had been crashed into by forklifts numerous times that had to be closed and opened with a crowbar by two people since the track was mangled. Other things include the company giving everybody in the plant raises except for me, catching me five minutes before leaving work to go on my weekend, and informing me that we had to work the next day, and selectively enforcing safety rules, and even making rules up on the fly. After about six months, I'd had enough and decided that if they wanted to constantly cite policy and safety rules to F with me, then I could play that game too. I would make this manufacturing plant the safest company on the planet and ensure policy was followed to the exact letter. This was now my mission. I began to slow my work way down and only do the jobs I was hired and paid to do. Instead of doing the workload of 10 employees with nothing in return, they now got exactly one person's worth of labor out of me. Customer orders began stacking up, deliveries were late, bad welds and welds that got missed during production were overlooked, causing the units to have to be repainted when they had to go back to the welding lines to be fixed. The warehouse became a wreck with containers backed up to the point that people did not even have room to work. I went from completing a large unit in 30 minutes to it taking me two and a half hours on the same one, not to mention all the repairs that needed done when they were missed during production, when before I would have caught them before the units even left the production line. Other petty things I did included not showing on Saturday to work when the manager would catch me at the last second and tell me I had to. I took to cutting out the text in the employee handbook citing that working unscheduled hours required management to notify you three days in advance and leaving a letter with that portion of the handbook on his desk the following Monday. There was nothing they could do since I was following the handbook to the letter. At this point, it was a game of who would blink first. They could lay me off and I could draw unemployment on them or I would quit. Next on the list was safety. They liked to hassle me so much about trivial things that I figured they'd appreciate me going through the plant and documenting every single last OSHA violation, safety violation, and anything else that wasn't right. I had a notebook that was filled with violations from one end of the plant to the other. 
Things like crane lifts that were being used improperly with J-hooks that OSHA previously warned the company about. The same J-hooks they liked to hide every time OSHA came through the plant. Welders that had frayed cords around puddles of water. Tools being left on top of units that could fall off and hit someone. Lack of ventilation. Particle counts that were too high. Forklifts that were not serviced enough. I tagged out equipment that technically shouldn't be used in its current state and locked out the forklifts that needed brakes or any sort of maintenance. Eventually, the production manager took the bait and untagged one of the forklifts that I'd locked out due to having bad brakes. Anybody who knows lockout procedure can understand what a massive F-up that is. Once I compiled my list of improvements, I went to the government official who was overseeing safety and procedure since we often worked on government orders. I gave him my notebook, informed him of my manager taking the lockout off a defective forklift, then went on break and waited. About 30 minutes later, I saw my manager walking back from the head office and looking PO'd beyond belief. Later, I heard from someone who knows him that he got punished severely, especially for the forklift. From then on, he avoided me and wouldn't even speak to me or look at me. After that, I continued to slow my work pace down and got a bit of satisfaction each day from the complete crap show the place had become and how backed up it was every single day. After I left the company, I heard he hired five guys to do my job and that they still did a crap job. Had they treated me better instead of coming at me like they did, they would have still been getting the top quality work from me that they got when I first joined them, and things would have went along just fine. I can't even imagine how much money I must have cost that company by sticking to the exact letter of the rules. And our next story. My worst job ever. When I was fresh out of high school, my sister's boyfriend offered me a job as a mechanic at a local dealership. The job was an apprenticeship and was at one of the worst dealerships I'd ever had the displeasure of working at. I could tell you dozens of stories about being an apprentice that would discourage anyone from taking up the position. However, I feel like my experience can be summed up in three examples of mistreatment. A fourth-year apprentice was taking a gearbox out of a small car, probably weighs like 30 kilograms or 60 pounds. He told me to catch the gearbox as it came out of the car while he undid the last bolt. I told him I wasn't comfortably catching a falling, heavy, sharp, unpredictable mass, and he told me he'd get me sacked if I didn't do what I was told. A fool could have seen it coming. The gearbox fell, I was unable to catch it, and the casing broke on the ground as it landed. The foreman came by and blamed me for the incident. My wages were docked to pay for the gearbox housing. I was later humiliated by another apprentice who filmed the event on his camera phone and showed the rest of the workshop me failing to catch the falling mass of metal. In another incident, I was asked to retrieve two tires from the cage, a literal lockable chicken wire cage about 10 square meters large and 4 meters high that was assembled out the back of the workshop to house our tires to fit to a vehicle. To collect the tires, I needed to climb a ladder to get them from a top rack. As I was up there, I heard the gate close and lock, and one of the mechanics had locked me in a cage as part of a hazing ritual. It was about 35 degrees that day, that's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and I was locked in there for two hours. Whenever a mechanic came past and saw that I was in the cage, they would take a nearby fire hose and try to hose me down in there. By the time I got out of the cage, I had such a bad sunburn I couldn't come into work the next day because I was still vomiting from the heat stroke. My boss did not approve the time off, and I was given leave without pay. For the final story, there was an incident where we recovered a bumper or a fender from a four-wheel drive after we attached a bull bar in its place. We used to save these bumpers in case we ever dented one, so we had spares, essentially. I was asked to place a bumper on two hooks, then climb a ladder to the top of the workshop and hang the bumper on the rafters at the top of the workshop for storage. I don't know if you've ever tried to climb a ladder with no hands holding a large, somewhat heavy and awkward load that can under no circumstances get scratched or dented, but I assure you it's difficult. As I was climbing the ladder, it started slipping on the greasy workshop floor and eventually collapsed under me, causing me to fall 4 meters or 15 feet, dropping the bumper, injuring my hand, and resulting in me once again becoming humiliated by a mechanic who was filming the whole ordeal. I was told that it was my fault that I fell off the ladder because I wasn't doing it right. 
and the unsafe work practice was not updated. I should note, I'd asked another apprentice to hold the bottom of the ladder, and they'd neglected to do so. Suffice to say, I was sick of how this company operated, so I spent the next two weeks taking photos of unsafe work practices. I took photos of lots of things, including people using a grinder with no guards, no goggles, no gloves, people smoking next to open fuel sources, an apprentice locked in a grease pit, another hazing ritual, and yes, I opened it after taking the photo, two apprentices moving a heavy piece of shop machinery into storage by pushing it into a flimsy wooden ramp, apprentices working at heights without railings, has chem materials that were stored, well, anywhere, not locked up, you get the idea. I sent the photos, along with some accounts of my personal experiences and anecdotal evidence of other unsafe practices I'd personally experienced to WorkSafe, a government body that finds workplaces for unsafe practices and ensures they clean up their act. The company I work for received over $100,000 in fines and had to spend probably another $25,000 in repairs to bring their workshop up to spec. The local mechanics union became involved too and caused problems around the treatment of apprentices and safe work practices in general. The place is still the largest employer of apprentices in the area I grew up in, but I hear they treat people a lot better now. Revenge is best when you're also doing the right thing. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.